We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So we are here today with Dan Michaels, the Brussels Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. Dan, welcome to the Energy Impact Podcast. Glad to be with you. Yeah, so you know we're trying a new format where uh, once a week or so we're you know trying to like look into the future with the news of today, and so it's super exciting uh, to have you on the show. Uh, I'd love to learn about you, but and also about your organization and the future of everything series. So maybe just you know tell us a little bit about who you are and where you came from. Uh, sure, I, I um, as you mentioned, I run the Brussels Bureau of the Wall Street Journal, but I also dabble in other areas, a lot of science and technology. For about 15 years, I covered aviation and aerospace. So I spent a lot of time in, in Airbus and Boeing factories and at airports. Uh, and I'm, I'm American, but have been living in Europe for many years. Where, where in the U.S.? Where in the U.S. did you grow up? Uh, from uh, New York, New York City. I kind of heard it. I'm from Long Island, so I heard a little bit of the New York in there. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I, I find technology fascinating um, and uh, interested in you know what's what's possible, what's a little bit um, uh, science fictiony. And uh, a couple of years ago, the journal, which I think you know people know from very sober and and uh, grounded business news and other news, we started uh, what is now a monthly section called the Future of Everything. Uh, where we're allowed to uh, write about ideas and and uh, projects that uh, let's say no investor would put money on, or you know, are not are not going to be on the uh, financial pages in the near future, but you know, could be you know, sort of um, uh, you know, SpaceX or Tesla twenty years ago or whenever Musk was getting started. So the idea is to sort of look over the horizon, um, but we are um, not bound by, uh, we don't have to have a paragraph in there about financial returns or, or anything like that. And where did that come from? Was that like user generated feedback? Like, you know, do you guys pull your audience every now and then say, you know, what kind of stuff do you want to read about? I, I think it's, it's a bit of uh, looking at what stories were doing well and realizing that these were things that you know our readers were involved in. You know, people who read the Wall Street Journal, you know, are not you know just on Wall Street. A lot of them are in, uh, in laboratories or you know, dealing with you know, scientific uh, technological developments, um, or they're in parts of businesses that are doing this. You know, most big companies have their uh, skunk works or whatever. You know developing the technologies of tomorrow. And you know, people just love to read about this stuff. You know, they want to know what the future is going to look like or might look like. So, you know, to some degree, this is our, you know, popular mechanics of the 1960s. And I think one of our, you know, first stories now a couple of years ago was about jetpacks, you know? <laughs> uh, we've been writing, everyone's been writing about jetpacks for decades, like flying cars. But, you know, some of these things, Finally, you know, are you know happening at least in a limited way, but uh, new technologies are are making a lot of things possible that weren't you know realistically conceivable not that long ago. You know, maybe they won't be. Well, maybe they won't make economic sense, but at least you know something like a jetpack is much more realistic now because of you know, all kind of miniaturization and advanced manufacturing and even technologies like the, you know, accelerometer in an iPhone. Uh, 
that could balance it. You know, these are the things that have allowed drones. So, you know, if you look at, you know, what drones can do, why not a jetpack? Why not flying cars? You know, flying cars, we're no longer thinking about like, you know, the one in the man with the golden gun, where it was like a Ford Pinto that sprouts wings or something like that. But essentially a drone, you know, the could have wheels or you know, operate another way. So uh, this is the kind of thing where we're free to look at. Amazing. And maybe before we get to the meat of this article that I want to talk about today, which it features you know, many nuclear reactors, maybe just a little bit more about you, though. You know, so you spent this time in aerospace previously. Do you remember where like the origin of your interest in you know, technology and flight and all this stuff came from? You know, probably a big chunk of it was growing up back the, you know, later today, as, as we record this, we're waiting for the, the Mars lander. And you know, when I was young, Viking was the thing. And, uh, you know, there's there was excitement about space. I, I remember I was a little kid when Skylab was, was up there. Um, and... Uh, it was all really cool and fascinating. Um, and I guess I'm just old enough to have come of age when people were still um, optimistic about technology and you know maybe there were things like you know, cyberpunk hadn't taken over and there wasn't the sort of Blade Runner Matrix view of the future. Um, and I still have a, a little bit maybe of the uh, 2001 view of the future where it was still clean. Yeah, it, it did get a little dystopian. Do you think that's going to switch? Do you think that's a cyclical thing and new science fiction might kind of take on a, a, a more clean and, you know, prosperous and optimistic point of view at some point? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm seeing signs of that. I mean, you look at, you know, the impact of the Internet these days. You know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough call whether <laughs> it's been a net benefit or, you know, it done net harm to the world. So. You know, technology is, you know, we can do amazing things with it, but, you know, so often it's like, you know, riding a tiger. It, that narrative that you just pointed out is pretty amazing. I mean, I grew up as a kid of the internet and I remember like, you know, my formative years of oh, the internet was going to democratize everything. It was going to make everything better. And as of these last, you know, few years, five years or so, even I, who was the strongest internet advocate ever, I'm now like, shoot, is this a net good or a net <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you look at, you know, what happened on January 6th and, you know, organized on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting questions to ask. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, for today, let's talk about mini nuclear reactors. When did you first start learning about them? How did you research this article? How did, how did, how did it come about? It's one of these, one thing leads to another, but through my much more mundane coverage of the European Union and things that go on in Brussels um, and marrying that with my, what I learned covering Airbus and technology, um, uh, one of the things that the European Union tries to do is, is put money behind technologies. And so about a year and a half ago, I did a story about how Europe was trying to copy the US model of university spinouts. Um, and it's finally taking off. And actually Oxford and Cambridge are leaders, but universities across Europe are uh, picking up on the idea that you know, their labs create amazing technologies and they might as well, someone should profit from this. Um, and in reporting on that, I was at Oxford and wanted to meet one of their companies. And one of their companies they introduced me to was actually a fission company. Um, and I did a story about a year ago, actually, for the same Future of Everything section about a new generation of, of fission reactors that are in development, um, a little bit further over the horizon than- You mean fusion, sorry. Sorry, uh, fusion. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. I, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I'm in this space, I always screw it up, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I was just refreshing my mind on, on, on fusion. Yes, I meant to say fusion, of course, yes. Yeah. So fusion, um, I do know the difference. Um, uh, yeah. So um, after I wrote that story about fusion, uh, I got a couple of emails from companies that uh, are trying to bring 
in fact, some of the same technologies that are you know, theoretically going to allow fusion to the world of, of fission and, and the sort of current generation of reactors, um, but sort of um, uh, bring in a new wave of technology. And um, so we were putting together another energy issue this year. And I said, you know, there's actually something new going on in, uh, in those, uh, you know, the nuclear reactors where Homer Simpson works. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then, and then, so, okay. So you kind of caught interest that, Hey, there's some you know, new, more advanced stuff coming down the pike. Uh, what happens then? What's the, you know, I'm outside the journalism space. Sure. What's the journalistic process? Yeah, it, it, it's one of these things also. That it, stories like this often come together when you get several elements falling into place. So I had done that story about fusion and purely by chance at, here in Brussels, the, the EU, there was a conference. Uh, I think it was actually the uh, former Secretary of Energy uh, Perry came through town because the U.S. actually was is pushing this technology, this small modular reactor technology. And um, there are several countries in Europe, uh, especially ones that used to be in the, the Soviet orbit, like Estonia, Czech Republic, Poland, where they want to stop using Russian gas. They, they, they don't want to be tied to Russia for energy. They, they don't want to be tied to Russia for anything. Um, and they're very enthusiastic about SMRs. Uh, and so I was like, hmm, there's a technology angle here. There's a political angle to it. So it was sort of a bunch of things fell together. And it wasn't just like, because, you know, as a reporter, you know, especially you know, for the Wall Street Journal, we get pitched by a lot of businesses. They're like, look at my product. It's wonderful. And it might seem wonderful, but you know, unless somebody's actually going to buy it, it's only mildly interesting. But when I saw that hmm, there are actually potential customers out there for this technology, it was like, okay, there's there, there's something to this story. Even if it never works, it's not just someone with a press release trying to, to get some column inches. Absolutely. Okay, so now tell me about tell me about the meat of it. What did you find when you started looking into it? What, what so what's happening? So the idea here is the technology for nuclear reactors, fission reactors that we know that we are familiar with, um, been around for decades. Um, uh, you know, first proposed. Uh, President Eisenhower, and I think it was 1953, gave a speech at the UN talking about atoms for peace and this idea that you know we'd just seen you know, atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs go off, but that same power could be harnessed for clean uh, electricity. Uh, and from there, you know, there was you know, years of, of development, went into a few decades of building out big nuclear reactors um, with, you know, famous for their cooling towers, which are you know, the, the, the most obvious part of a nuclear reactor, but actually they're just big buckets to cool the water. The, yeah, that's not even where the nuclear stuff happens. Not at all. No, <laughs> no. The, uh, the, the part where the action takes place, you know, looks more like a small bunker. It looks, you know, maybe the size of, say, you know, a fuel tank. Uh, that you'd see like you know at an airport or something um uh, and one of the things that happened over the years as reactors were built and as they started aging was a discovery that nuclear power is pretty tough it, it and the realities of nuclear fission and what's going on inside there really put a lot of strain on the physical equipment. So um, in a lot of industries, the more you know and the more you do, you go down the learning curve and the economies improve. Um, you know, car production is a perfect example, or even say airplane production. You know, Boeing and Airbus produced in a good year 10 times as many planes as they used to and at lower price. It wasn't working like that with nuclear energy. It, you know, it, it continued to be quite expensive. Um, and 
one of the things, one of the ways that reactor builders and utilities got around this was to make the reactors bigger because the cost per kilowatt hour uh, improved, you know, faster because you know, the cost of you know running the reactor didn't increase on, you know, as, as quickly as the cost of building it and maintaining it. So over time, there was a shift towards bigger reactors. Well, that bumps up against Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and, and um, um, the Japanese you know, near disaster, or disaster um, in Fukushima. Um, and so nuclear power really kind of hit a wall. I mean, you know, a few years back, Germany, after Fukushima, Angela Merkel said, we're getting rid of nuclear power. Um, and it's almost impossible to get a, a nuclear reactor project approved in most countries these days. Because uh, people are terrified of what happens if you know, something goes wrong. So while this was going on, um, people who were still in the industry, um, started looking at like, okay, how could we adjust the technology? You know, how can we address these concerns? At the same time, you get a totally different group of people, environmentalists saying something has got to be done about greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we've got to get, definitely have to get rid of coal. We probably need to get rid of natural gas also. And while we may not, like the idea of radioactivity and radioactive waste from nuclear plants, still it's better for the in, for the atmosphere than fossil fuels. So maybe we need to look more seriously at nuclear power. And this is not just executives from you know, GE and Westinghouse. It's also people like Bill Gates. Yeah, his book that just came out is like, pro-nuclear in every chapter. Pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, and I mean, there was this um, Netflix uh, uh, series about him, I think about a year ago, where one of the segments was about this company that he's put a lot of money into developing nuclear technology. And the whole idea behind that was we need to make nuclear power safe, or at least make the, the risk of it manageable so that we can protect uh, the atmosphere. And so these two forces come together and uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, partly to promote U.S. technology, U.S. leadership in the field, um, to counter uh, funding and developments in China and Russia in the field, um, puts quite a bit of money behind research in these areas sort of next generation nuclear. Um, and so what you've gotten over the past few years is proposals, ideas for new types of reactors. And there's quite a wide variety. The, the, the simplest is essentially a scaled down version of current fission reactors. Then you get some that you, rather than using water circulated through it, they use things like molten salt, which is um, sounds a little bit science fiction-y, but it's something used actually in big solar arrays because um, it's just a, a, a liquid that retains heat really well um, and operates under lower pressure than water, so there's less risk of explosion. Um, and one of the things that the designers of these systems have done is from the outset, look at safety issues and say, okay, how can we design these so that if something goes wrong, when something goes wrong, we don't have a situation like we've seen to happen. And so a um, couple of designs, the reactor is actually underground. And so the idea is, you know, one design, it's actually all the time sitting in a, basically a bathtub of water so that if everything goes wrong, at least there's water there to cool it. Yeah. Uh, another idea is similar, and you know they just have to like pull the stopper out, and the you know the the basin that it's sitting in floods with water. Uh, and, 
yeah. how come these ideas, um, it seems like there's a resurgence of it in recent years. How come even at the dawn of the nuclear era, they didn't try all these concepts out, put it underground, put it in a tub of water, that kind of stuff? I, I, I don't know the history that well, but I can only imagine from what I know of that is that they didn't quite understand how tough it was going to be. And I think, you know, they didn't understand um, how corrosive radiation is, the, 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 the wear that it puts on um, metal, concrete. Uh, it was just a, you know, a naivete about, or let's say, um, just lack of information. I mean, but think about those, those um, 1950s, 1960s uh, civil defense films of like duck and cover. You know, a, a Soviet thermonuclear bomb goes off and you're supposed to duck under your schoolroom desk, you know, so. It seems so silly. You know, I, you know, some of it was propaganda, some of it, you know, so sort of deliberately downplaying the threat, but some of it was just a lack of understanding. Yeah. Um, it took time for, you know, ex an experience for people to really understand, uh, you know, what happened over time and you know remember you know now we can you know do computer modeling of things you know which all which isn't always perfect but at least we can you know, do it but you know back in the 50s and 60s it was slide rules and uh uh you know t-squares so you know, they just tried it so in um in researching this and looking into this and now you've got this really nice comprehensive understanding of you know where things are going the political forces the economic forces the changes to technology what are you most excited about what, you know and and you know I know I know it says the future of everything but you know if you were to say hey based on my research and what I've done you know where do you put the odds of us seeing this type of technology emerging in the next few years I think you will see it. Um, I think there's enough momentum uh, and there are enough uh, places like say, you know, Estonia is quite excited about it. Um, Estonia is a very small country, million and a half people, I think. So they, they, you know, even on a good day, they wouldn't need a giant reactor, but maybe they could uh, take a small one. Um, and there are some utilities in the United States that are also looking at it to replace coal. And I think if, when that happens, and it probably will you know, get heavy government subsidies, uh, then it'll be really interesting to see if the economics work because there are big debates. And it's one of the things I got the most reader mail about is whether by scaling down a reactor, you actually can make it economical because it's a kind of almost counterintuitive argument. You know, if big is more efficient, think about like, you know, you go to Walmart, you know, the, the family size Wheaties, you know, is cheaper per unit than, you know, the, the personal size, right? Most things we know, the bigger, you know, the per unit cost goes down with size. And what the SMR makers, these modular reactors, small reactor makers are saying is no, we've redesigned these things so thoroughly that in fact, on a per unit basis, they're cheaper than a giant one. And that kind of makes sense to me. It's like, you know, with solar panels, you never see one giant solar panel. They come in these modules, modular, and then they yeah. snap them together on site. Is that the basic concept with modular nuclear as well? It's an element of that, yeah, because a part of it and one of the areas where they say they can get economies is an economy of scale and manufacturing that, yeah, to produce, you know, a mammoth solar panel would be expensive, it'd be expensive to transport it. No, right. So with, with SMRs, what they say is, if we can make these things smaller, we can produce them in factories and churn them out. Uh, or at least, you know, the elements, and then you know, they can either be assembled and put on the back of a truck or big pieces of them can be assembled and put on the back of a truck and shipped. Unlike current reactors, one of the problems, um, I think it's in Finland, there's a reactor they've been building for just far too long because they, they build a part and then they discover there's a flaw in it and they have to break it down and build it again. And so if you can do it, you know, in a, 
on a smaller scale in a factory under controlled conditions, the idea is you can, you can meet the necessary tolerances for safety, but do it with economies of scale. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, my last business was in the drone space. So funny you mentioned drones earlier. And there was just so much learning that happened in our manufacturing process. So thank God, you know, our early drones, they were industrial drones. So, you know, they cost $5,000 to make. But, you know, we had to throw a bunch out because, you know, they didn't perform well or, you know, they didn't make it through, you know, safety testing or quality testing. And if if they were 500000 a piece and we were you know, getting our processes, our manufacturing in order, it, it would have sunk the business. Um, and so I kind of, maybe this is a little bit of what I'm hearing from you as well, that if you make it smaller to start off with, your mistakes are cheaper to fix, and then you get to be a bigger, better company, and then all of a sudden the economy start working out better. I think, you know, that's part of it. It's also just the, the fundamentals of it too. And this gets into some of the physics of, uh, nuclear power and that has to do with the pressure and the heat and that a with a, a just a smaller reactor you you don't need as much shielding you don't need as much protection so the 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 gizmo itself can be simpler and you know, because like and the risk for, you know, another thing is like the risk of a small reactor having a meltdown is much smaller than the risk of a big one. So you know, all of these things, at least the way advocates present it, make it, you know, allow you to simplify things um, and um, redesign in a way that cuts out a lot of cost. Now, critics say that that's, you know, sort of, those people are fooling themselves. <laughs> and isn't, but isn't, I mean, I, I love when, you know, private companies, you know, jump in and try things out and some of them work and some of them don't work. And sometimes it's a business reason. Sometimes it's a market reason. Um, but isn't that the beauty of it? If it's small, a bunch of companies who think that they can make the economics work, all try and maybe one or two of them succeed. I mean, yeah. Tesla or yeah. Space. I mean, You've got at one end, you've got, you know, there's a joint venture of GE and Hitachi who have been, you know, in this business for decades since the beginning. And what they're trying to do is just scale down what they've got. Then um, you've got, yeah, startups like this one that Bill Gates is behind called TerraPower, um, where, you know, they've got a much more kind of cutting edge approach to things. And then there are ones that are even further out in the future, which I didn't really get into for my article because, you know, I was, I was only looking a little bit beyond the horizon, not far over the horizon. But yes, I mean, there are people, you know, coming up with all kinds of ideas, um, you know, for what to do with, um, with this technology um, and how to, you know, how to make it economical and safe. Um, so, you know, that's, yeah, that's the, you know, it's going to be one of these classic situations like we've seen in space and we're continuing to see in space, or maybe we we'll say something like the hyperloop where it's a great idea. It's expensive. There's a lot of fundamental questions out there, you know, maglev trains, you know, these things, it's like, who's going to spend the money and, you know, can it actually be economical in the long run? You know, the jury's still out. Yep. Okay. And so we talked a little bit about there's some geopolitical traction, obviously these forces at play, you know, you don't want to be dependent on Russian gas, Estonia, which is right there near Russia, they're excited. So I see that happening. Are there any other like market pull forces, any other like companies that are uh, interested in maybe uh, cleaning up their industrial energy with this that you've seen? I think there are a lot of companies who would be interested and they're a lot of applications. I think you know, if you are you know a business person and trying to decide whether you're going to put your money into you know, buying an SMR, you're probably still not quite at that point yet. But for example, there are a lot of utilities that now use um, coal and gas for you know what's called the base load. Uh, and I'm sure your you know listeners know all this, but you know a power grid needs a certain basic level flowing down its wires, um, you know, that, that wind and solar aren't yet at the point of, you know, being reliable enough to provide. And 
So if um, if that's now being provided by uh, uh, fossil fuels that are not great for the environment, um, those need to be taken out. Well, one of the, the advantages of SMRs that proponents are, are, are touting is you could almost drop in an SMR to replace a coal-fired uh, uh, power uh, plant um, and just, you know, then hook it up to the same generator because both of them essentially are very large, expensive kettles. You know, what they're doing is boiling water that turns a turbine. And so if you can produce that boiling water, you know, in a more ecologically friendly way, you've accomplished something. So there are a lot of people out there who are excited about this. Other applications include um, splitting water into hydrogen fuel and oxygen. And that, because one of the issues that, you know, people who are looking to remove fossil fuels from the economy face is what do you do about gasoline and all the other derivatives that are, you know, are liquid fuel that we need? Well, hydrogen, you know, is being touted as a, as a potential replacement, but it's expensive and requires a lot of electricity to, to um, uh, get hydrogen out of water. So if you can use nuclear power to do that, uh, you're creating uh, liquid fuel for transportation uh, without, without adding to greenhouse gas emissions. Amazing. Um, as we wrap up here, maybe you can just tell us, you know, what's next for you? What other topics are you going to write about? And is this a topic that you're going to continue to revisit in the future? I'll definitely keep an eye on this, especially because the geopolitics or technology aside, the geopolitics of it are fascinating for, for Europe. Um, I, I also want to come back to fusion at some point, because here in Europe, down in the south of France, um, the world's largest uh, fusion reactor project is coming together. It's called ITER, I-T-E-R. Yeah. yeah, Bernard Bigot runs that. I can uh, yeah. make an introduction if you haven't met him already. I, yeah. I, no, I did I did have the pleasure of interviewing him uh, for my article last year. Really fascinating guy. And yeah, he's, he's awesome. Like, yeah, He's like a he, French all-star. They pulled him in when that project was in trouble, and they're like, this is our number one guy in the country <laughs> to save this. Yeah. He's done an amazing job, and he's got quite a task ahead of him because – they were explaining it to me that they, in, in a classic sort of international project, they sourced every country that's involved, like 35 countries, is contributing something. Yeah. And and they're all sending these parts, but there's no there's no assembly manuals. It's not like, you know, you open up the box from Ikea. And, and um, they're going to have to figure out how to put this thing together, kind of like as these parts arrive from Korea or Russia or wherever. Um, but they say they're going to get it built in, I don't know, five years or so and hope to be smashing atoms together in 10 years and we'll see. But that's um, that's one that's sort of in my greater backyard that uh, is going to be really interesting. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much. If there are any other energy topics you ever want to come on the show and talk about, we'd be happy to have you. So thanks again and look forward to talking more. It's a pleasure talking to you. Great. Thanks. Our leadership in science and industry our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.